So how are we going to pay for our kids' college when the price of college continues to go up exponentially every single year? Well, we are definitely going to discuss this in our Tuesday tip again, so stay locked in to part two of education funding. Hi, my name is Carson Graves, certified financial planner and president and CEO of the Retirement Education Center, and I want to welcome you to part two of education funding. Now, last week we discussed a couple of options that you may want to utilize when it comes to your child's education. And we discussed the pros and the cons or the advantages and disadvantages of using those particular types of education funding accounts. So now we're going to continue this discussion to give you some additional options that you may want to explore when it comes to you funding your child's education. So let's go ahead and jump into our lesson today. Okay, so last week we talked about the education saving options of using a private investment account and a custodial account. These are known as uniform transfer to minor accounts and uniform gifts to minor accounts. So if you don't understand these two options here, just go back and look at part one of our education funding video. But today we're going to cover the final three options that I want to talk about for education funding. And that's the Corverdale education savings accounts, the 529 plans, and of course, Roth IRAs. So let's go ahead and look at how these accounts can have both advantages and disadvantages as well when it comes to funding your child's education. Okay, so let's talk about this Corverdale education savings account. They also have the acronym of ESA. Now, when you're looking at a Corverdale education savings account um, or ESA account, they are actually similar to a Roth IRA in the fact that they allow individuals to set aside up to $2,000 per year per child for the possibility of tax-free distributions of earnings for qualified education expenses. Understand it has to be for a qualified education expense. So what are some of the advantages of this type of an account? Well, of course, I just mentioned it. You get a chance to have tax-deferred earnings so any income or capital appreciation will be tax deferred. Another advantage that I mentioned already is that the income and capital gains taxes will not be paid on any qualified educational distribution. Another benefit that some education funding options do not offer is that you can change the beneficiary on this account. This is not the case when you're talking about the uniform transfers to minor accounts. You cannot change the beneficiaries on those accounts. Once they're set, they are set in stone. But with this particular account here, if you have a child who decides they don't want to go to college, well, you can actually change that beneficiary to another person. Another advantage in this account here is that you can self-direct the investments. So just like an IRA, you as the owner of an ESA account can self-direct the investments that you want to use for that particular account. It's not a mandatory thing. So you can put the type of equities that you want to put in or the type of bonds that you have offered in that account, but you have the option of doing that. None of these education funding options will have just advantages, right? There are going to be some disadvantages that we must discuss so you can be educated about it. So the first disadvantage that I want to discuss when it comes to an ESA account is that there are limits on who can participate with the account. If you are a single filer, and your adjusted gross income is between $95,000 and $110,000, you cannot contribute to an ESA account. And if you're actually a joint filer, that income phase out is between $190,000 and $220,000. If you make between those amounts for your adjusted gross income, you will not be able to participate in an ESA account. The other disadvantage, and I'm sure that you may already have seen, is that your contribution limit. You can only put up to $2,000 per child on an annual basis. That's not going to be nearly enough to fund most colleges, especially when colleges can end up costing you anywhere between $100,000, $500,000, $600,000 $600, in the future for your child. So only being able to put $2,000 a year in these accounts probably is not going to foot the bill when it comes to your college education funding. Another disadvantage that must be discussed with this account is that you have a required distribution of these funds when the beneficiary reaches the age of 30. So when, once they reach the age of 30, you have to have these funds distributed out of that account. You can't just leave it in there. Now, when it comes to the student aid impact of having an ESA account, 
that is going to be considered favorable. Why? Because the parent will be the owner of the account and not the student. Now, if you recall our lesson from part one, remember when it comes to student financial aid, anything owned by the student, they can look at 20% of those assets to be used for college education funding. Whereas if it's owned by the parent, less than 6% of those assets may be utilized or considered for college education funding. So make sure that anything that you do is owned by you, the parent. So now let's go ahead and talk about the very, very popular 529 plan. Now this plan is very familiar with many people and it is a very, very attractive alternative when you're talking about funding your child's education. It has some tax advantage options for saving for college that always must be explored. I personally have this type of plan for both of my kids that I started as soon as they were born. I think there are some very attractive options about a 529 plan that if you're planning on your kids going to college, this is probably going to be an area that you want to explore. Now, as a side note, any assets that you have in another 529 plan can be rolled into another 529 plan. Also, you can take assets from your uniform gifts to minors account or your uniform transfer to minor accounts. You can roll that into a 529 plan as well or your Coverdale savings accounts. You can roll that into a 529 plan. So how can this be a very unique strategy for you to utilize? Well, let's just say you have a child and you're not sure that they are quite college material. So yeah, you open up a custodial account, you put money into it, and so maybe when they reach the age of majority, they may wanna use those funds for college or they may wanna start a business. But let's just say you realize they are college material, they wanna to go to college, but you don't want them to have full assets of those funds. Well, you can transfer that money from that account and roll it into a 529 plan and now you, the parent, will have control over those funds and the kid can be the beneficiaries of those funds for college purposes and tax advantage purposes as well. With that being said, let's talk about these advantages of a 529 plan. Well, one, there is no adjusted gross income limit like you have with an ESA account. People with high income can make tax deferred contributions and will not be prohibited from putting money inside of a 529 plan. So you can make a million dollars a year and you can still put money inside of a 529 account. Also, if you're using the money for qualified education expenses, all of the money has grown tax deferred. It will also come out tax free only if you're using it for qualified education expenses though. Another great advantage is that you can front load a 529 plan up to five years. So we know that the annual gift tax is $17,000. But with that being the case, you might want to put more money inside of this account. Well, you can front load this account up to five years. So that means that you could literally put up to $85,000 and more if you're talking about gift tax splitting. We don't want to get into that in this video, but you can put as a single person up to $85,000 into this child's education account without even going over any type of gift tax exclusion. Another benefit of a 529 plan is that you can change the beneficiary. As I mentioned, you cannot do that with a custodial account, but with a 529 plan, along with an ESA account, you can change the beneficiary at any time. Plans can also be used across state lines. So what does that mean? If you have a 529 plan in any said state that you're in, if you decide to go to an out-of-state school, you can use that 529 plan for an out-of-state school as well. Also, because there has been a new ruling in the SECURE Act 2.0, some of the funds in your 529 plan, if they go unused, meaning that if your child decides not to go to college, just understand that money that you would have to pull out of that 529 plan, if it's not used for a qualified education expense, could be penalized. But they do have a new ruling now that some of those funds could be rolled into a Roth IRA for the beneficiary if they decide not to go to college. So that can be a huge, huge benefit as well for actually opening up a 529 plan. Now, although there are some great advantages to doing a 529 plan, there are some disadvantages as well. One of them is that there are going to be limited investment options when it comes to a 529 plan. So when you're doing a custodial account or a private investment account, you pretty much have an open window to what you can do in those accounts. But when it comes to a 529 plan, 
typically they're going to have the investment accounts catered for you and you pretty much have to choose those accounts so it's going to be limited investment options another disadvantage is like i mentioned you have to use it for the kids education you cannot just use it for whatever you want if you use that money for anything other than qualified education expense there can be taxes and penalties on those funds that you take out of that 529 plan now when it comes to the student aid impact it is favorable again because the parent will actually be the owner of that plan while the child is the beneficiary now that leads me to the last account that I want to discuss when it comes to education funding and this is the one that's probably overlooked sometimes and that's a Roth IRA. Now we know that a Roth IRA differs from a traditional IRA in a couple of ways. One, the contributions are not deductible like you can in a traditional IRA on your tax returns and two, qualified withdrawals from a Roth IRA is going to be free from federal taxation. Now that is not the case when it comes to a traditional IRA because that money would have gone in pre-tax. Now what are some of the advantages for using a Roth IRA for education funding? Well, One, if you take money out of a Roth IRA early, you can have a 10% early withdrawal penalty, but that penalty would be waived if the funds were actually used for a qualified higher education expense for your child. So that is a very, very big positive if you're putting money away in a Roth IRA. Another advantage to that is that the funds do not have to be used for education expenses. So in this particular situation, what if your child decides not to go to college and you have a Roth IRA in place, which is already a good thing for you because that money is growing tax deferred and would be able to come out tax free. But if they decide not to go to college, then those funds are just sitting there waiting to be used for you and your retirement funding. Now, although those are some great advantages to using a Roth IRA, there are still some disadvantages that are going to apply. One, when you're talking about a Roth IRA, if you're really thinking about using it for education funding, again, there's going to be limits on how much you can put into a Roth IRA every single year. For 2023, that amount is $6,500 if you're under the age of 50 and $7,500 if you're 50 and older. So if you're thinking about funding that child's education, just know that that may not put a big enough dent in their funding options for college when you're talking about a Roth IRA. And honestly, that is really the only disadvantage that I can think of when it comes to a Roth IRA when you're talking about trying to fund a child's education. That there's just a limit to the amount that you can put in there, unfortunately. Now the student aid impact, again, is favorable because you, the parent, will own your own Roth IRA. The student will not own it, so therefore it will not have the significant impact of any type of financial aid that the student may be seeking for education as well. So I really do hope that part two of our education funding video gave you some more insight into some options that you can utilize for your student in trying to fund their college educational goals. Please note that these videos are created for educational purposes only and that you should always seek out your own financial advisor, your own tax advisor, and your own attorney regarding your personal situation. Also, if you are looking for a fiduciary financial advisor to help you with these types of complex financial matters, we highly recommend that you utilize the links in our description below. Go ahead and schedule a one hour free consultation with us today. And if you found this information to be beneficial, we only ask that you subscribe to our channel, like this video, and share with others.